Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for, for being here today, Fergal and, and Nikki and Michael. We really welcome this opportunity on the committee to discuss the report. Indeed, I was delighted to be at the launch of that, and I think it's the... Um, it's just really timely and it's really significant and we can work with it here in terms of the report and I have gone through it and through it several times in what it might mean for us. So I want to thank you for, for that progressive initiative by IBEC and the importance of the report I think is that it captures and it measures some of the dividends of the Good Friday Agreement. Now we're acutely aware on this committee that the Good Friday Agreement has only been partially implemented and full implementation would obviously mean even greater prosperity for everybody living on the island. Now, using these economic measurements, we can project and plan uh, the all island initiatives to enable uh, future growth and prosperity, and I think that's the real value in it. Now, when you talk about re energizing and evolving the operation of the Good Friday Agreement during the 25th anniversary, I couldn't agree with you more. The Good Friday Agreement is a, is a living and breathing document that belongs to everybody on the island and must continually be used to improve the lives of everybody living on the island and indeed the Irish diaspora as well. Now you rightly point out the benefits of the integration for all island planning of projects uh, to implement crucial policies, particularly for physical infrastructure in energy and in transport on the island, avoiding the duplication, which I agree with, uh, leveraging assets and reducing the costs uh, for the consumers. So my first question on, on that is, you rightly say as well that in order to optimise the full potential of the all-island economy, a new joined-up north-south policy framework should be in place. And my first question is if you could elaborate on that role and the specific actions that government and parties need to take um, to establish that framework, because I too believe it's the way forward. I might ask my three questions, if that's all right, and then you can divide them, divide them between you. In terms of transport, because I think, again, that is really important, the reopening of the Western Rail Corridor has been a long-term Sinn Féin policy, as you know. Um, so as well as meeting the transport needs, we would see that it's a catalyst for sustainable growth and maximising the opportunities along the Atlantic Economic Corridor. How important do you think it is to accelerate the delivery of the transport infrastructure while meeting our climate change targets? And I note in it as well, when you rightly, and I think this is very significant to point out, you rightly um, say that we need to address the uneven levels of prosperity and coming from the West and having an interest in obviously the Western economic um, uh, corridor, uh, I think that is something that needs to be the forefront of, of our minds as well. And finally, I just want to ask you in terms of the, um, uh, the educational opportunities and the, 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 the student mobility across the island. Uh, again, how important uh, you think that is, and I, I say that in the context of we're having some hearings here in the or in the education committee in a couple of weeks' time um, around opening up third-level opportunities across the island. In, in page ten of, of your own uh, document, in the second paragraph, you write you report rightly refers to the 17,000 students leaving the north to study in Britain, and only one third of those returning home, and the the, the problems that that presents for. Um, um, for the labour force in the north and indeed for economic growth uh, in, in the north as well. Uh, so I want to ask you, um, what do you see as the economic benefits of facilitating and encouraging student mobility across the island and what the knock-on effects would be in terms of labour force planning and indeed in terms of meeting the challenges of the shortages of, uh, of labour as well across the island. So there are my three main questions to start with. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Deputy. Yeah, Fergal, is it? Yep. Yeah, th yeah, thanks, Chair, and, 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 and thanks, Deputy. Um, so I, I might start, and I might ask my colleague Michael to, to come in on some of these as well, particularly maybe in relation to how we envisage the future evolution of the framework. Mm -hmm. um, just in terms of, of context, and again, the 
the, the earlier comments from the Chair in terms of, and as you rightly positioned this Deputy, in terms of the economic significance that we see it of Belfast Good Friday Agreement, when you think of it as the Celtic Tiger phenomenon in Ireland, I, I think there were, there were many factors in its success, but I don't think that the Belfast Good Friday Agreement has ever gotten full recognition as one of those key factors, actually, that saw the unprecedented levels of prosperity over the last two decades. Um, albeit with, with some interruptions, obviously. So, so I, th I think, and, and I think it's really important now that uh, for the 25th anniversary, that you know, we and this is where we see the role of business. Mm -hmm. That business has to tell this kind of story of economy and what it meant for for investment and employment and, and all of the other factors that we mentioned. Um, to, to to work through your questions, and again, I'll work backwards, maybe um, on the educational piece. One of the things that we're noticing, we have been noticing before COVID and has become much more evident since, is the degree to which the all island labour market is now functioning as a, as a single labour market. So that is much more pronounced than it would have been in the past. We note in our report that we now have a labour force on the island of 3.6 million. So it's got real scale. And whether you're an indigenous company or you're a global company coming to establish operations in Europe or on this island, they're looking at that opportunity of the 3.6 million and the kind of nature and diversity of skills that they can get within that, within, within, within that labour force. So again, in, in, this, in, this, in this new world of work, distance from your employer doesn't matter. Um, having those skills on the island and having kind of reasonable kind of access, you know, through good public transport, which we'll come to as well, um, is important, right? So the, it has really opened up the all-island labour market. So I think that's going to become much more of a phenomenon in terms of making sure that we have an all-island labour market that works seamlessly in all its facets, through an education system, through skilling and upskilling, and then through the, um, through the regulatory framework, particularly around social welfare mm -hmm. and tax. And we have a lot of concerns that we're not doing enough, actually, mm -hmm. to, to really get the most and the optimum out of that all-island labour market. To your very specific point, then, on, on education, you know, where we have... Um, students choosing, I suppose, to, to pursue education outside or away from the island, we know that there is a less probability of them returning to, to bring those skills and that education back to the all-island economy. Mm -hmm. So we definitely see that as a challenge. And then we can see in both jurisdictions that we have various pinch points, blockages, shortages of capacity, um, where by students are, in many cases, almost being forced to, to leave the island, in, again, in both jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. To, to pursue their educational opportunities. So there, 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 is, a, a, there is a less um, less opportunity to be able to bring those back in, into our workforce, whether that's going to be in health. Um, I was listening to recently the story of veterinary students that are in such large numbers going to Eastern Europe. Um, from, Can from I Ireland. just ask you on the veterinary mm. thing, because we're obviously under, it, it's an ongoing discussion mm. here now with expressions of interest. Would you think that it's crucially important to have the same, to have a veterinary school, wherever it is, that would cater for the needs of all of the island and not just in this state, so that there wouldn't need to be conversion courses and everything after that, that we need to get it right from the beginning? And Well, I suppose our, own, our main observation on this would be the opportunity, again, of the economies of scale. And if there is there a business case to have both centres of excellence, right, and an economy of scale on the island of Ireland, that to us would seem like a very logical um, route to proceed. Uh, so we definitely would see the benefits in that. Um, and again, we see it, I suppose, in terms of business engagement with the education sector, and particularly, I suppose, from both the recruitment perspective, but also from the research perspective. They want to engage with centres of excellence, um, and business won't take any kind of recognition of whether it's in Northern Ireland or in Ireland. They want to go where the, where the excellence is for their particular areas. Um, but they do see considerable merit in terms of working on the island for mm. obvious reasons. Mm. So again, you know, the, while, while we're a growing population, uh, an all-island population of 7 million, it is still a relatively small island and where we can have shared centres of excellence across that island uh, from a business perspective. That makes a lot of sense, be it from, either from education or from a research perspective. So we should be all island proof in all of our policies and actions at this stage, shouldn't we? So whether it be setting up a veterinary school or whatever it might be doing, we need to be thinking and government departments need to be thinking on the basis, does this um, um, suit our all island policy? 
And reflecting the fact that the labour market for that 3.6 million people has changed completely in the context of kind of new ways of working and mobility within, within, within the labour market. So I think we, we need to look at everything in relation to the labour market and the education and, and, and research mm. and, and how we support labour mobility across the island in a very, very different way mm. than, than even from before COVID. Mm. Sorry, I'm interested in getting on to the framework now, sorry, just yeah. in terms of elaborating so, on it. I'll, I'll, th I'll take the, the transport and the, and, the, and the regional one, then I might hand to, to Michael to, to talk about the framework. Um, so we, we, we've made the point in a number of places in the, in the report that when you look at the island of Ireland, the, the prosperity dividend and how significant it has been, one of the interesting benchmarks we've pulled out that if you benchmark the island of Ireland against all of the regions right across the United Kingdom, um, we are the second most prosperous region outside of London. So this is a very, very high income and, and prosperous island. But within that, clearly, there is um, disparity. Um, it is clear that Northern Ireland has not benefited as much as Ireland has mm. in, in, in terms of that, that prosperity bounce uh, for all sorts of, of reasons. But, but equally, um, across Ireland, in terms of the different regions, we have concerns in, in, in terms of regional disparity as well. Um, a number of years ago, we set out an ambition that we would be working towards the infrastructure and the services for an all-island population of 10 million people. Mm. Um, I noticed the Housing Commission in recent weeks observing that in Ireland, we need to be planning for a mid-century population of about 7 million people. So that all-island 10 million is becoming increasingly into focus, actually. Mm. And as we plan for that, Clearly, we would like to see a much more effective balanced regional development and a much greater sharing of that prosperity, benefit and dividend um, right across the island of Ireland. But again, as we see the, the all island economy kind of flourish and that kind of integration improving and that, and that movement in the labour market that I'll go back to again, I think that the upside for Northern Ireland from here on out, I think, is, is, is going to be as strong in, in, in terms of what we've been experiencing in, 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 in Ireland. And the, the difference in in income levels that we have now uh, against the average in uh, in the UK has really become quite spectacular in, in, in terms of household incomes in Ireland versus the average in the UK. But I think that regional element, both for Northern Ireland and across Ireland, I think is very, very significant. And, and transport is absolutely an element of that. Um, we've very much been advocating for uh, Atlantic transport corridors and having a proper all-island um, ring transport mm. infrastructure to, 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 to really match that ambition of 10 million people. Thank you. So I might hand to Michael maybe to, to talk the about framework. the framework. So thank you, Rose. Uh, it's interesting for me, obviously, sitting here as perhaps the one who's been on this pitch for quite a while now. And one of the key differences today is that on previous appearances before the committee, I was talking about the possibility of economies of scale and proximity mm. and conditions. And now we can talk about that as a proven principle. Mm rather than having to pro pr promote it. And I think as Fergal mentioned, the hard numbers there of you know heading to 10 billion for cross-border mm. trade, who would have imagined? Even myself driving to Belfast, now it's extraordinarily different in terms of just the sheer density of traffic all the way. There's no speaking about loud, the chairman isn't here afterwards. There was no, used to always fall off after Dundalk mm. and very quiet until Newry and a pick up then until Belfast. Now it's all the way along the corridor. So I think that, what we're building on here, I think, is the fact that business, I think individuals, I think communities are actually into this new phase of the island's interaction with each other. And I think when we put forward the idea, the keyword is, keyword there is new joined up North South policy framework. Of course, the original joined up framework is in strand two of the agreement. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, you know, an awful lot of research and development work was done prior to the conclusion of the agreement, post the formation of the single market and the ceasefires, to build on the possibilities they created for business and for people to engage in more north-south interaction with the stability of the institution, the principles and the processes that it provided. So we're on a real position of strength here now. And I think that's the key thing. And the second point is, I suppose, that Having come to deal with the reality of the UK being out of the EU now, we have the protocol, we have the relative stability. Again, you can see the confidence that that has given business 
to underpin this new all-island model with investment, with additional activity, with growth, etc. And I think it's how can policy strengthen that movement and come in behind and support it in a positive and progressive way. And if I, if I go to the report at the end and I just walk you through very quickly some of the key areas of energy I think we haven't mentioned to date and it's absolutely mm -hmm. vital. And again, it's one that covers all three strands. I noticed the British Irish Intergovernmental Council in their communique last week talked about beginning work in this new energy space around renewables, etc., which of course are entirely interconnected, not just north-south, but also east-west and between this island and the continent. So you have that triangularity of connectivity that's underpinned by regulation, as Fergal said, and you have the economies of scale, etc., and all the opportunities of renewable. You've mentioned transport infrastructure. Again, the key there was always a return on investment, economy of scale, an island of seven instead of 1.5 and five. The one point, or sorry, two million now in the north, like that two million is an even smaller number if you think about it from an investment perspective mm. than the five that we have. So the combining of the two actually is the real mutual benefit from a Northern Ireland perspective. In terms of R&D, again, in an all island context, we have Science Foundation Ireland, we have the work of the universities. We can see how academics, sharing knowledge, experience, and all developing in the unique conditions of the island, going back to veterinary, as you were saying, medicine we have with cardiology. I mean, identify this in the 2013 report, it's excellent, centre of excellence for the island makes more sense than two centres of excellence. It always does, especially in a specialist area. Um, we, have, we mentioned FDI, which I know you have a particular interest in, and I know we have the model of Tourism Ireland, in terms of promoting it, we know internationally companies look to invest in the island as a whole. There are difficulties, obviously, with agencies, etc. But surely you could work out some way of presenting, you know, particularly sectors like agri-food that are connected to the experience economy and tourism. Some new narrative that we can we can work in in, in terms of presenting to an international audience and use the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement to do so, particularly in the United States where there is a really sharp focus on how the US can continue to support the process at the political level mm -hmm. and being able to uh, kind of communicate that to the, to the business community I think would be really positive as well. Mm. Um, you know that, I suppose, to tackle the hard not people often talk about, well, unionism won't engage, but I know from my work with the Joint Business Council that mm. businesses, irrespective of the personal convictions of the chief executive, will follow where the money and yeah. where the opportunity. So I think it's important to be, have opportunities to connect with, uh, with the business people on the ground who are doing the hard work to make their place more productive, but are running into obstacles and difficulties, so anything that can be done and support from this side of the border I think is important mm. to help out in that regard. They just mentioned specifically since I've been reappointed the Program Management Committee, I think the Peace Plus is a really important opportunity to build on what the Shared Island are doing, Science Foundation Ireland, etc. And again, this sends a signal to the business community that the states, the two states, the European Union, the British government is getting behind the work that they're doing to make this investment and, and to grow their businesses. And particularly, as Fergus says, we do it in a real way around the all-island labour market, around needs that we have today, around climate action particularly. And you know I highlighted at the, the launch that legislation in the North requires the North to take account of, of targets here, but the legislation here, as I understand it, currently doesn't have a similar requirement in it. So I think there's things like that where we're planning our own future. To, I, I prefer the word ingredient, that there's always a North-South All-Island ingredient in the mix. It won't always make sense. You know, we can't say that everywhere it makes sense. You know, you have to evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis. But it should always be an ingredient that's on the table like the cook's when they're putting put it when they're putting the policy together and, and looking at how how, the, how that should kind of happen and I